today we'll begin taking a look at chapter 9 circulatory responses to exercise <clears throat> so that'll involve, involve kind of an introduction wherein we find out what are the parts take a look at the heart take a look at the blood vessels and so forth and once we get a handle on that then we'll talk about the actual uh, ways in which the functions of the cardiovascular system respond to exercise, what changes take place. <clears throat> so there's a list of topics you can follow along with as we go through this, uh, of this chapter bit by bit. So <clears throat> the circulatory system, the heart and all the blood vessels, work with the pulmonary system, the lungs, because the idea is to do, obviously to deliver blood to the lungs to pick up oxygen and then deliver that to all the cells of the body and also to get rid of CO2 from the blood in the lungs and to expire that into the atmosphere. So the cardiopulmonary system or cardiorespiratory system uh, will accomplish those tasks for us. Um, <clears throat> the cardiovascular system also has the job of um, regulating body temperature distributing hormones throughout the body, number of processes. <clears throat> During exercise, some of the basic changes are going to take place that will explain the, the undergirdings of include an increase in cardiac output, right? More liters per minute of blood are going to be pumped out by the heart to distribute to all the working muscles. The blood pressure will also be raised, which will additionally help move that blood through all the blood vessels to the tissues. We'll also see how the, how the vascular system, the blood vessels, will be modified in such a way as to shrink down and block flow to organs that aren't really critical for exercise and then provide a larger amount of the, of the cardiac output to the working muscles. So we'll redistribute blood from so the, the intestines and stomach and kidneys and so forth to the muscles. All right. <clears throat> so in the circulatory system, the heart has the sole purpose of raising the pressure of blood at the great arteries, and then blood because blood flows from higher to lower pressure regions. So the heart raises the pressure high at the arteries, and then it just flows down through all the different parts of the of the vascular system, dropping the pressure all the way until you get back to the heart and the heart raises that pressure back up again. So that's the sole function of the heart in this operation. Arteries are defined as vessels that carry blood away from the heart. Arterioles are the smallest arteries. They're like less than a millimeter in diameter uh, right before you enter into blood capillaries. And capillaries are microscopic vessels with such thin walls that that's where the oxygen and CO2 actually diffuse from the blood into the tissues and from the tissues into the blood. So all the meaningful diffusion happens in the capillaries. Nutrients diffuse into the tissues from the capillaries as well. <clears throat> and then once the blood has passed through capillaries, it enters into venules, tiny veins into veins, and veins have the definition of, of vessels that carry blood towards the heart. Now, <clears throat> We'll take another look at, the, at those definitions in just a bit. Why it's so important to have them. They seem self-evident, but they're not really necessarily. Here's a, a little schematic diagram of the heart cut open so we can see that there are four chambers of the heart. Two smaller atria up here on the base of the heart, and then two larger ventricles down here in the lower part of the heart. <clears throat> That's where the muscular power comes from to really raise the pressure of blood and move blood through your vascular system. So atria are kind of like collectors when the heart is resting and then right before a heartbeat they, they fire some blood down into the ventricles, stuff them full, and then the ventricles pump that blood out <clears throat> to, the, to the arteries. So what arteries? Well, let's look first at the left side of the heart. This is the left ventricle. It has a very thick meaty wall and it pumps blood out through a valve called the aortic valve into the aorta, the largest artery in your body. It kind of hooks around, there's a little button hook here, and then it comes down behind the heart, and here we see the aorta, 
not continuing inferiorly to, to have branches that um, that send blood to all parts of your body. Here are some branches that are going to take off to send blood to your head and neck and your arms, and then down here to your trunk and your and your legs. <clears throat> Here's the, the the right ventricle pumps blood out through this artery, the pulmonary artery, the pulmonary trunk, which then splits into the left and right pulmonary arteries, and that blood is destined for the lungs. It's drawn in blue because to indicate this blood is somewhat depleted of oxygen. And so we're going to send that oxygen poor blood to the lungs to get re-oxygenated. And here it is coming back to the heart in the pulmonary veins. The pulmonary veins have plenty of oxygen, right? Because they just came from the lungs. So again, veins just means vessels that carry blood back to the heart. It has nothing to do with the oxygen content. <clears throat> all right, one thing I didn't mention. When the right heart pumps blood out to the aorta and through all the arteries and arterioles in your body, other than those pulmonary circuits to the lungs, the blood returns to the heart through the vena cava. So blood from the left side of the heart circulates through the body and comes back to the right side. Blood from the right side goes to the lungs, circulates through there and comes back to the left side. We'll see in a second. Um, <clears throat> between the the atrium ventricles are one-way valves. The heart has no sense of where blood is going. All it does is contract and wring out the volume, force the blood out, and then relax, fill back up, wring out the volume, and the valves determine the direction of flow. So you can see that these valves allow blood to go from the atria down into the ventricle, but the way they work is once the ventricles start to contract, blood gets up underneath these, these leaflets, they're called, of the valve, and they slap shut. They're pushed inward upon them one another, and they slap shut, forming a sound. That's part of what we hear with the stethoscope when we listen to the heartbeats. So then blood cannot go back up into the atrium. It's forced to go out through valves into the arteries. Here's a little picture of a so-called semilunar valve. These look like little crescent moons. So semilunar valves in which the this, if the if the right ventricle were contracting, those little valves would flatten out against the sides of the pulmonary artery and the blood could pass outward and stretch those arteries and raise the pressure and it would try to come right back in each time the heart takes a rest. It beats and then it takes a rest and then it beats. And during those rest periods, blood tries to go right back down in the ventricle, but it can't because this little valve will also slap shut, making a sound. The aortic valve, same thing when the, right, when the left ventricle contracts, Blood is easily forced out, but then when the heart rests, the stretched out aorta with lots of pressure tries to push the blood right back down into the ventricle. The aortic valve slaps shut and prevents it. Blood can only go one direction. So we have the, the so-called mitral valve here, the bicuspid valve. Mitral valve is a, word, a name worth knowing between the left atrium and the left ventricle. And the tricuspid valve is the name of the valve between the right atrium and right ventricle. Those are important valves and they, they go wrong fairly frequently and there are disease states produced by valves that don't close efficiently or don't open sufficiently. So we should know the names of those valves. <clears throat> All right. Um, here's a little listing out of parts of the heart wall and we'll see another diagram of this too, but the meaty part of the heart wall is called the myocardium. Because myo, you may remember from our chapter on skeletal muscle, means of muscle. So the myocardium is the muscular part of the heart wall. There's an outer lining called the epicardium. It's a slip lubricated membrane on the surface. And as we'll see, that is in turn surrounded by a sort of like a leather sac with a lubricated inner lining. So the heart can writhe all around inside there, but the pericardium we'll see is surrounded by. Um, <clears throat> on the inside, there's a lining of cells on the inside surface of the heart called the endocardium. The same cells that line the blood vessels and keep them slippery slick so that blood flows through but never sticks and clots on the surface, that same uh, layer of cells is found inside the heart called the endocardium. <clears throat> All right, so why is the, the, the left ventricle so thick and meaty? And the right ventricle is so skimpy. Look at that skimpy little wall, muscular wall, the myocardium of the right ventricle. Well, 
the right side of the heart, the right ventricle, pumps blood through the pulmonary circuit. It takes deoxygenated blood and pumps it to the lungs. And that's it. One organ it needs to pump blood through, and it's a rather elastic vessel organ, so it's pretty easy to pump the blood through there. It doesn't take much muscular work. The left ventricle pumps, pumps blood to every organ of your body, trillions of capillaries all throughout your body. That takes a lot of raising pressure very, very high to be able to drive it through those all those vessels. So the right, the left ventricle, I'm sorry, has to raise the pressure up very, very high. It takes a lot of work, a lot of muscular work to do that. So uh, we have a very thick, meaty left ventricle that pumps blood through the systemic circuit, it's called, this right here. So the left ventricle pumps blood to the aorta through a bunch of branching arteries and then smaller and smaller branches till we get to arterioles and then finally capillaries all throughout your entire body from head to toe are just from different beds they're called of capillaries and then to back to veins and back to the right side of the heart and the right ventricle then pumps blood to the lungs to be reactionated. So two separate pumps but yet they're operating in the same kind of closed circuits closed systemic circuit and closed pulmonary circuits and they work together to provide the services needed to get the oxygen to all blood cells in your body. <clears throat> the again the walls of the wall of the ventricle comprises three layers. The epicardium is this outer surface, it's a lubricated slick lubricated surface membrane. Then the myocardium, the meat and then the endocardium is the again the layer of slick covering cells. But outside the heart, the heart is ensconced in like a leather sack, a fibrous connective tissue sack called the um called the, the outer pericardium, this fibrous jacket on the outside of the heart. Um, so the, the heart is it can't stretch. The heart has a fixed amount of space in there. There's plenty of room for it to expand and fill with blood and then contract, but that's a, still, it's a fixed container in which the heart sits. So you have the endocardium, myocardium, epicardium. The, I don't know if I mentioned the inner surface of the pericardium, the fibrous pericardium is also a lubricated surface. So two lubricated cellular membranes face to face that allow the heart to move around during its violent contractions without any friction. <clears throat> so there's a listing out of those, those um, structures. Um, the heart itself needs a blood supply, and there are coronary arteries. Coronary means of the heart. Coronary arteries deliver the, the blood uh, to supply the needs of the heart. Um, the coronary arteries uh, give us a little bit of trouble sometimes, and we'll discuss that, because it's very important that the coronary arteries can deliver a lot of blood during exercise, a great increase in blood flow during exercise, because the heart needs to always do aerobic respiration. You need to deliver all the oxygen needed for all of the work of the heart. It can't just do anaerobic respiration and then have lactic acid build up and, and fatigue and rest, obviously. Not going to happen. <clears throat> um, this little section uh, encourages us to compare heart muscle tissue, the heart muscle cells, to skeletal muscle cells. Um, and there's a lot of similarities. The way the, the, the sarcomeres are set up and the, and the contraction happens with the the cross bridge cycling of actin and myosin filaments is the same. Tropin and tropomyosin, same thing. So all you know about skeletal muscle in terms of the mechanics of shortening the, the sarcomeres is the same. So that there's striations present, right? Those are produced by all the orderly arrangement of the of the filaments in the in the sarcomeres of the of the myofibrils. So there's striations, but there's some differences. <clears throat> One particular difference is that the the, the cardiac muscle cells are short, stubby cells that have branches in them. And the, therefore, since the cells are short, they need to be stitched together end to end with lots of, of, of junctions that hold them together, cellular junctions. And the, the patches, the dense areas between the, that knit the cells together are called intercalated discs. Lots of desmosomes in there that hold them together. And also some, some passageways through which ions can pass, gap junctions. Right? If one cell depolarizes, then ions will immediately shoot over into the neighboring cell and it'll depolarize. So the cells communicate electrically. <clears throat> Skeletal muscle cells are so long they span the entire length of a muscle. 
right? If you look at any one of your muscles in your body, each mu each skeletal muscle fiber spans that entire length amazingly. And the way that is done during development is to take hundreds of cells and kind of s attach them together into a long cylinder, and therefore there's lots and lots of nuclei, multiple nuclei that arise from all those original embryonic cells that form those super long cylinders of skeletal muscle, whereas cardiac muscle cells are short stubby cells that have one single nucleus per cell. <clears throat> so, a lot of similarities. One more difference between the two cells. Let's get this next slide going. When, when skeletal muscle cells contract, calcium is released from the sarcoplasmic reticulum due to depolarization of the T-tubules. That happens in, in cardiac muscle cells too, but in cardiac muscle cells, about 25% of the calcium comes from outside the cells through membrane channels. So when a cardiac muscle cell reaches the threshold and has an action potential, sarcoplasmic reticulum releases calcium and channels open in the membrane and calcium enters, and that binds to troponin and moves the tropomyosin and so forth. Um, the heart muscle cells are controlled by, a, by pat, a patch of pacemaker cells. That's what triggers each heart cycle, pacemaker cells, and they just fire off an action potential, which then spreads through the whole heart muscle. There's no motor neuron involved, whereas skeletal muscles, as you know, each mu each fiber has to be innervated by a motor neuron uh, at the neuromuscular junction in order to get the thing to contract. As we said, heart muscle cells are 100% aerobic, or at least only in the minutest sense can they do anaerobic respiration, so they can't fatigue and rest, whereas skeletal muscles, the fast glycolytic muscle fibers, man, those things can, can produce gobs of lactic acid and, and do a whopping amount of power output and then stop and rest. <clears throat> oh, I should mention heart muscle cells are non-regenerative. If you damage them, you may survive. You'll have a scar in the place of where those muscle cells were and there's no getting them back. There's no replacing them. All right. So, as I was mentioning, the, the coronary arteries are so critical for delivering the sufficient blood flow to meet the needs of the heart and muscle. But as vascular disease progresses, and as progresses in all of us at some rate or another, plaques begin to build up in the vessels and start to narrow the opening of the vessels. That's called occlusion. So we're going to start to occlude the opening of the coronary arteries and <clears throat> sometimes if it becomes occluded enough and then maybe during an exercise event or a stressful event when a lot of epinephrine is making the heart pound all of a sudden a plaque will rupture and a blood clot will form right at that spot and then no blood can flow there we completely block that part of the coronary artery it might be a branch of the coronary artery and then downstream some heart tissue is going to die that's what an infarction is. Infarction means death of tissue due to lack of oxygen, lack of blood flow. So we're going to have some, some cardiac muscle tissue. Part of the myocardium is going to die. And if, and if you survive that event, then some scar tissue is going to replace that dead myocardium tissue. There's no replacing it. And that's good because it, it'll patch up. It won't get a hole, but this cat, the scar tissue doesn't contribute to the contraction. And if that happens a few times in your life, your heart's going to be pretty weak after all that replacing of good tissue with bad or with just with inert tissue. Interestingly, exercise is cardioprotective. <clears throat> For one thing, it reduces the rate of advancement of vascular disease. If you exercise regularly and have a moderately good diet at least, you probably will never have a heart attack unless you have a genetic predisposition for very severe vascular disease, you'll probably never have a heart attack because the, the, the plaques will never build up sufficiently to start blocking the flow. If you do have a heart attack, let's say you started your exercise program later in life and you already had a fair amount of plaque buildup, well, you'll do a lot better if you exercise regularly. If you get your heart in shape and your body in shape, um, if you do have a heart attack, there'll be a lot less damage to the heart and will be a lot more likely to survive. So exercise reduces the amount of, of damage to the heart during a, during a heart attack. So that's a, so it's well worth, in your own life, exercising obviously right straight through, 
And if you are working with clients and prescribing exercise for them, yes, it's worth it for them to get into shape, even if it's later in life and say, well, maybe the damage is already done. No, you can gain benefit from exercising. <clears throat> Here's like a little graph, just if you would like to have, to have a visual there. The percentage of cardiac injury during the myocardial infarction, how much of the heart is going to be damaged in an untrained heart? A lot more, on average, a lot more damage in these, uh, in these so-called percentage damage units versus a, a trained heart, a lot less damage. <clears throat> I wouldn't worry too much about what the units of this means, uh, but we're going to have a lot less damage to the myocardium in a trained heart than in a, in a, in a sedentary person's heart. <clears throat> well, what if we need to, we want to assess the degree to which um, the vascular disease is affecting the <clears throat> excuse me, affecting the opening, the patency, the, 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 the passageways of all these coronary arteries. Here they are shown in this diagram. Well, what we'll do is um, send a catheter in through an artery, typically through the femoral artery in your thigh, right up through the aorta, snake it around, right, and make it turn the corner right into a, into a coronary artery or near a coronary artery, and shoot some contrast medium into the artery so that then the blood becomes visible in, a, in an image. And here's a, 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 an image of the coronary artery tree in part of the heart showing the opening where the blood is, because right, we put some contrast media to make the, the blood show up on this beautifully. And look at these two spots where there's, a ve there's very serious occlusion of the coronary artery. <coughs> Excuse me, there's going to be enough blood flow at rest perhaps, but certainly not during exercise. One of the immediate remedies that's used for that is to place a stent in the in the um, coronary artery. Another catheter will be floated in there <clears throat> and, and made to turn the corner, which is this is kind of a miraculous trick of skill to make that catheter come through the aorta, turn the corner into the little coronary artery with branches right off the, the base of the aorta. Here we go. Here's the aorta in the the coronary arteries branch right off the base. You got to get a catheter to turn the corner and, and snake it right down into this area where the occlusion is. And we can watch it on the camera. And then um, <clears throat> once we get it right in position in, in the midst of the plaque, inflate a little balloon that stretches out this wire mesh, bends the wires essentially. And when we remove the catheter, it'll stay in place and it'll, it'll press outward on the walls and provide a, an improved, look at the improvement in this coronary artery after placing the stent. So that's pretty cool stuff. A, a fairly non-invasive, cheap remedy. It's not permanent, but it's a pretty good way to treat um, coronary artery uh, disease and plaques. So I want you to know what that was. I'm sure you've heard of stents and people getting stents after they've had some kind of a cardiac, you know, some pain in the chest or something. What about the heart cycle? Well, when the heart contracts, as I said, there's a pacemaker in the heart, a group of cells that shoots an action potential into the heart muscle, and as each muscle cell depolarizes, ions diffuse into the neighboring cell and it depolarizes, and we have this wave of action potential spreading through the entire heart muscle. That wave of, of, of contraction is called, the phase is called systole, the contraction phase of the heart. Because the heart does contract when this pacemaker triggers a contraction, pumps out some blood, and then it rests. Systole is the contraction phase. Diastole, pronouncing that E on the end, is the relaxation phase. The heart takes a rest and fills back up with blood. And then when the pacemaker fires another action potential, it'll spread through the whole heart and have another contraction, another systolic phase. <clears throat> During exercise, the systolic and diastolic time periods are reduced. We're going to crank up the heart rate, and there's going to be less time for both systole and diastole. And that's okay because we're going to find out that we can return a lot more blood to the heart during exercise so that it doesn't take as long to fill up the heart chambers and we're ready to pump another beat. <clears throat> Here's just a graphical illustration of the time period. If this bar represents the entire period of time, of a heart cycle, both the, the contraction and resting phases. And we see that the systolic phase takes up about 
maybe a third of that total. I guess a little bit more than that. Um, and during during exercise, we're going to reduce the resting phase enormously. The major way the heart rate increases is by not waiting around so long for the pacemaker to fire another heartbeat. We're going to crank up the pacemaker rate so that it fires off another uh, heart cycle a lot sooner, and then we're going to get that blood pumping thing. Systole shortens a little bit too, but the main thing is the resting phase is shortened as the pacemaker operates more quickly. <clears throat> so during diastole, the heart is filling with blood. The pressure is very low, but we're filling the heart up with blood. It's going from the atria down through the AV valves into the ventricles. And then the heart contracts, pumping blood out. It's called ejection. But during systole, the pressure in the ventricle rises very, very high, rises higher than the pressure in the arteries in order to push blood out the door from higher pressure to lower pressure. <clears throat> so when the heart contracts, the AV valves close and make a sound you can hear in the stethoscope. And then when the heart relaxes, they, the pulmonary and aortic valves close and you hear a second sound. So the heart has a whooped up, whooped up sound if you listen to the, to the steth to the heart in the stethoscope. First the AV valves close, then the pulmonary and aortic valves close. So it's closing of the valve, actually physically slapping shut that you hear. It sounds muffled like when you try to yell under the surface of the swimming pool. You can hear sounds, but it's very muffled compared to what you're used to. <clears throat> Here's a, a look at the changes in pressure in the ventricle during diastole over here and during systole. <clears throat> The pressure in the ventricle is very, very low during diastole. It's filling with blood, but it doesn't take much pressure to push the blood through the AV valve into the ventricle. This is probably a little misleading. This pressure during diastole should be rising a bit here in the, in the atrium and the ventricle. And then when the heart contracts, the ventricle contracts. Look what happens to the pressure inside of it. It goes way up to like 120 millimeters of mercury. And then the heart rests and the ventricle pressure goes right back down. It turns out this is significantly higher than the pressure in the aorta, and so blood goes right out the door into the aorta, from higher pressure in the ventricle to lower pressure in the aorta. During that, so we can prove that the blood is going out when we raise the pressure very high once we get into this top part of the, of the pressure curve. Look what's happening to the volume in the ventricle. Suddenly the ventricle uh, is reduced in volume as blood is ejected out into the, into the aorta. And then the heart rests, the pressure drops right down and the heart rests. The AV valve opens back up again and the ventricle starts to fill back up. So in the next part, we'll start looking at other at more aspects of the circulatory system as the heart pumps blood through all the arteries and capillaries and veins and back to the heart again.